Thank you for joining me today, Paul. Thank you for having me. Pleased to be here. Well, just to get started, um, uh, we're going to allude to, to your past for a second. You've been uh, behind a number of successful oncology biotechs, and your latest venture is one of the few Australian companies in the radio pharmaceutical space. Can you perhaps expound upon your powers of perception when it comes to discovering new technologies in these spaces and the obstacles along the way to those discoveries? Yes, certainly. So the, the radio pharmaceutical one is um, quite an interesting space because um, in Australia, we have two existing listed companies. The first one is Telix, which has been incredibly successful. And the second one, which is Clarity, which has just come out as a listed company last month. Um, I, I wouldn't describe myself as having powers of perception as such. I, I've been in the sector long enough to sort of look for things that stand out and give you a feel as to whether you should proceed. So I, I lived in the States for 11 years and I became very well connected to the major medical institutes and um, research centres in, in not only in America, but also in the UK and Europe, um, which have given me the opportunity to find technologies. I'm not a, I'm not a scientist, but I have a, a deep, deep network of uh, experts who I seek, seek guidance from, and they probably polish my perception, if you mm -hmm. to use the word. And I look for sectors that uh, of, that show great promise or uh, so, so to speak, hot. And, you know, five or six years ago, that would have been immuno-oncology. Uh, recently, more recently, it's been cell therapy and even uh, reference to the radio farm, radio pharmaceuticals. So um, I use my networks, my experts, and I mm -hmm. go around to the various institutions seeing what they have that's available for license. So that's how I basically find new technologies. Absolutely. So yeah, you've, you've definitely alluded to that network of experts you use here, which sort of leads me to my next question around how you actually fell in, into this sector. You, you're a political science major out of the University of Sydney. And, and with that, you took on you know, obviously the world of entrepreneurship and you started and thrived in the space of health and biotech. What drove you to this sector um, in particular and this way of in this living, I guess? Yes. Well, I guess a political science major is not really... There doesn't seem to be much of a connection there, but I do have to say that my um, head scientist and founder of the oncolytic virus technology imaging, Professor Yunan Fong, who's one of the most brilliant physicians and scientists around, his first degree was uh, medieval poetry. But um, wow. look, I, I started life as a, a stockbroker and then I joined an investment bank. And then um, when I was young, I saw the opportunity uh, to become the CEO of a small ASX listed hospital company, mm -hmm. which was acquired by uh, Ramsey Healthcare. And when that was acquired, I went off to the US to have a look around and I met some oncologists and I got exposed to the biotech sector. Mm -hmm. And that was like someone flipping a switch and that set me on my way. So I, I, I found it incredibly exciting and thrilling. The people were brilliant to talk to and deal with. And, um, was the best decision I made to get into the life science sector. Absolutely. And, uh, um, and what, just out of interest, what did flick the switch? What was it about the sector that, that really, I mean, really attracted you and enticed you to, to stay on that journey, Paul? Well, look, I met an oncologist from Yale University mm. who was studying uh, prostate cancer. Mm. And I asked him to explain the science, which was completely and utterly obtuse to me. I had no way of really understanding what he was saying, but when he told me what he was trying to achieve, I, it, I thought it was astonishing. It was peering into, you know, the almost like the origins of life, so to speak. And uh, that for me seemed terribly exciting. And then I saw this enormous uh, biotech market and life science market in the US, of massive, and the money going into it and the intellectual horsepower being applied to it. I thought, yeah, that's, that's a good place to be. Amazing. Now, I mean, with, with your ventures in the space of life sciences, um, I'm sure you've picked up on a lot of best practices as well as stumbled upon your own ways of doing things. Um, but in terms of uh, identifying an opportunity uh, as well as carrying it to an exit or a listing, um, now, obviously, that's a careful balance of, of two aspects, of, um, which is both research and, and commercialization. How can, do you find that entrepreneurs in the biotech space, for instance, in the life science space in general, um, 
are often struggling to make that balance or keep that balance between the research and the commercialization aspect of their ventures. Yeah, well, there's there's sort of three types of people um, in terms of entrepreneurship in the sector. I think there's the pure scientists, mm -hmm. then there's uh, those that are not scientifically trained like myself, mm -hmm. and then there's the third who are a hybrid of business and and science who have made the transition out of the scientific world and can do, they're not that common, they can do quite mm -hmm. a, good, a good job of it. Um, uh, for me, I have, to, I'm not scientifically trained, mm -hmm. so I have to make sure that I've got experts supporting me. Mm -hmm. So wh when I, uh, when I look at a piece of technology, obviously I want it to come from, um, I want it to be in a sector which is showing great promises I mentioned earlier on. Um, but I always ask myself, is this, is this investable? Can you build a story around it that investors will be excited by it? Um, I say to myself, is, it, is, the is the drug or the technology really druggable? Is there a product to be had at the end of the story? When it gets, can it get approved? Um, so I, I think it, it's a blend. Not a lot of scientists make the transition over into a fully blown commercial enterprise that may go public. Some of them do, yep. but not a lot because that's by, by definition, they're not trained for cap because capital markets are an enormous part of a biotech company because half your life is spent raising money because they tend to be black holes for capital for many years. So I think having, having um, some knowledge of the capital markets is a definite advantage. Do you think, uh, if, especially for those early on who don't have access to all the time to, to obtain the, the level of knowledge needed to do that successfully and effectively, what sort of advice do you have for them in terms of reaching out to people who can help them along with that journey? Yes, look, it's, it's, um, it's a difficult one. In the early days, a lot of biotechs have to, uh, you know, fund out of their own pockets or with friends mm. and family. And um, I find a lot of those companies have very unrealistic valuations because it's a very easy exercise to pull up a whole list of companies in the same space yes. of the fortune and say you're the same, therefore your valuation is this. So um, I think you have to be um, very realistic in the early days about the main thing is to get the money to mm -hmm. get the project going, get some drug made, start doing some preclinical experiments start producing some data mm -hmm. and if the technology is as good as you as you think it is and the data comes out nicely then the money will follow okay but in the early days you might have to swallow your pride a bit on valuation and give away more of the company than you wanted to give away because it's your baby and you're, you own 100 percent of it now but one thing's for certain you're on a path of dilution for the next five or six years for sure absolutely so in one of your past interviews, Paul, um, you mentioned that the VC ecosystem isn't, isn't perhaps deep enough to support many early stage biotechs in Australia. And uh, I assume by deep enough, you're referring to the amount of capital available um, for these biotechs. And they're not willing to deploy that amount, a, a suitable amount of capital to those to these companies. Is that where, what you were uh, alluding to? A little. I think, um, look, unlike the US um, and Europe, Biotech is not yet an established asset class in Australia. It's getting there. Um, and the number of life science funds or hedge funds that are buying biotech equities is certainly going up. I mean, compared to five years ago, there's substantially more interest in the sector. But, and, and the VC sector, though, is not anywhere near uh, the size as one might expect. It's growing. I mean, one wag said to me once, well, all the adventure has gone out of the venture capital uh, mm. community in Australia because they're very cautious and they take a long time uh, to make up their mind. Uh, we, we don't have very many dedicated life science analysts, for example, in Australia. There, there's a lot of analysts I, 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 working for brokers and banks that are actually not scientifically trained, but they are writing research on life science and biotech companies. So um, there is money here. There's no doubt about that. But um, the, the VC system is still, still growing. 
Absolutely. And, and so um, I guess that, that prompts uh, someone who is starting on their journey and, and looking to raise capital to look beyond Australia. Is that what you would suggest? Because if there is that gap in capital, a, a lot of a lot of good ideas may go you know, to this mass graveyard if they're, if they're not, I guess, number one, effectively communicated to the investor market. Um, and even if they are effectively communicated, there's a lack of interest in the Australian market. So are you seeing a lot of that going offshore? from the, from, I guess, the top research entities here in Australia? Well, look, if you're a private, if you're a small startup, private biotech, the chances of getting funded out of the US, in, in my experience, in my opinion, are pretty close to zero. Um, I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but it, it, it's uncommon. If you're a small listed biotech company, sub 100 million, you're a micro, micro cap company, and that's also pretty tough. Because you've got to think that someone deploys two or three million as an investment in you, and your daily trading's thirty or forty thousand dollars worth of stock. How do they ever get out of it? It would take them forever. So the 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 market for both the investor appetite in the U.S. for private and small publicly traded biotechs out of Australia is the tough one. I, I mean, I'm I, I'm not saying you shouldn't go because I I have gone over the years. Uh, to every VC under the sun and to all the investor conferences and that, I think it's worth pitching at them and being there and asking them to, to take an to take a meeting. But I think in the early days, it's a struggle to get money out of them. Paul, um, when, when you're caught up to take up one of these positions uh, at a listed company, um, what, what would you say is the first point of action? What is your process of identifying the issues at hand and obviously pursuing those solutions? Right. Well, um, I generally don't take positions on listed companies that I don't have a major interest in. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, where I have in the past those sort of things you just asked me, you should, just as a matter of due diligence, you should have already sorted those out. So, mm. I mean, the, the, the process of taking a board position, I think, or the decision to take a board position on a listed company is a serious one. So you need to pre be pretty comfortable that you know what's going on in the company um, and you should identify those issues beforehand and where you feel they need to be resolved or solutions my advice would be you probably should sort that out with the, the chairman of the company before you join because you mm -hmm. might find there's um, not a, uh, um, a commonality of uh, views about what you're concerned about. So my, my response to that question would be do your DD first and then make up your mind whether you want to get on board and make sure that if there are changes needed that other people on the board agree with you. Excellent. Well, it brings me to the next point. So you, as you mentioned, you are the founder and you have an interest in these companies. You are the founder and, and have been the executive chairman of, of three uh, life science companies listed on the ASX currently. Um, you're the founder of Imugene, now known as uh, the largest biotech in Australia. What, what have you seen across this portfolio um, of experience uh, in terms of fundamental drivers to the success uh, uh, for the growth of these companies that you've been a part of and have founded? Are you asking in reference to being a director or just the success of the companies generally? The success of the companies do, do, um, generally, generally, correct. Yeah, so um, I think uh, they have to be in a sector of life sciences, which is, to use a crude term, on fire. So that would be things like uh, cell therapy and CAR-Ts, uh, immuno-oncology generally, maybe checkpoint inhibitors um, and, as I mentioned, something like radio pharmaceuticals, which I think are, are really coming in, into their own. You, you need to make sure that the intellectual property is sound because most biotechs, not all, but most don't own bricks and mortar. Their main asset is their intellectual property. Mm -hmm. you, you need to have a very, very good management team because after the technology the most important thing in a biotech is the management team. And you need to, need to have a management team that have very specific domain experience relevant to the technology because a lot of it, well, certainly in the technologies I'm involved in, it requires a high degree of expertise to know how it all works. So just having a, 
a generalist sort of person, I don't think cuts it. Um, you've got to have um, uh, a clear path to the clinic. So if the if the drug is not already uh, in a clinical trial, you be for me, you have to have a line of sight to when it's going to get in into the clinic. And I don't think the market ha- the capital market has much of a tolerance for anything which is more than about a year away or so from going actually into the clinic. And, and, and you want to see some evidence on why you think the drug works. In other words, what does the preclinical data show that the drug does? Now, we, we know, we, we've known for years that what happens in a mouse model when you cure cancer doesn't translate into humans, but you should at least have compelling preclinical evidence that the drug has activity and has the chance of working. Absolutely. Uh, and along the same line there, um, uh, Paul, I want to ask you this, this final question in relation to uh, the cancer therapy company, Chimeric Therapeutic, which uh, you obviously successfully led their raise, which was uh, 3.5 times oversubscribed. So you led that raise. Um, it's, it's an important question because I'd love to abstract, have you abstract um, from the success of this story? What can, we, what can we take from the success of this story in order to help other uh, CEOs, founders who will be raising quite soon or raising watching, uh, after watching this uh, interview uh, in terms of ensuring a raise like that uh, that's oversubscribed and successful? Yeah, look, I was, I was lucky that I was able to acquire the technology from a a leading cancer center in the US called City of Hope. Mm -hmm. Um, It was a drug that was about to go into a phase one clinical trial. Those drugs are hard to find, particularly given it came, it's in an extraordinary area, which I've alluded to or commented on. This is cell therapy, so CAR-T therapy. Um, The provenance of the drug, not only from the institution being City of Hope, but the inventor, uh, Professor Christine Brown, extraordinarily well-regarded scientist. Um, the pre-clinic, preclinical evidence, that is all the experiments she'd done uh, leading up to going into the phase one, was very powerful. The drug had good IP. Um, the, the, the drug had already been sent to the, 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 the data package, had already been sent to the FDA, FDA to get an IND, which is the regulatory instrument that allows you to... Um, to, to run a clinical trial. Um, and then on top of that, I was able to poach the chief medical officer from Legend, which was the largest biotech IPO on NASDAQ last year. I was able to poach the chief, <coughs> excuse me, commercial officer out of Kite, which is arguably the most successful CAR-T company in the world. So I had a management team like no one else. And mm-hmm packaged it up and uh, people could see that patients were going to get the drug very shortly. So I had a nice confluence of all the right ingredients that brought it together. So, but I, I think the, the reason it was successful and it resonated is because the science was an area that was very, very uh, promising. Um, uh, again, to use the word, it was a hot area of science in the biotech field and it was very close to a clinical trial. So if you get all those ingredients, um, I, I think the investment community respond pretty well. Absolutely. absolutely. Um, it goes to what you were saying before about getting the right components and the right story to tell the investor community as well. And it seems like all those factors were there. Well, Paul, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, and hopefully we can talk again in the future and best of luck with your ventures. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks.